Welcome to IABM TV. Uh, I'm Lorenzo Zanni, research analyst uh, at IABM. I'm joined today by Alan Gill, uh, director of uh, localization at the LAX, and uh, Maz Ajumaili, uh, head of business development for UK and Europe at Zoo Digital. Uh, the topic today is the globalization of uh, media and entertainment, and we're going to talk specifically, ab specifically about uh, localization. So could, if, if we start from you, uh, Alan, could, could you tell us a little bit about uh, your service offering uh, at the LAX and what you do in terms of uh, localization? Yeah, um, so my LAX does many things other than localization. So we do digital cinema, um, digital delivery, commercials, um, like we have a company called Rushes that do a lot of um, advertisement. So we have probably 27 offices world, um, globally. Yeah. Uh, we ha have over 5,000 employees full time. Um, we have offices in London, LA, just name a few. We've got Dublin Studios in Paris and in Spain, uh, in Barcelona and Madrid. Um, we probably, from the localization side, we probably deliver about over a million minutes a month. I think, um, including all digital deliveries, I think we deliver 60,000 plus um, digital assets globally. Um, we service all, all the major studios and um, broadcasters and some of the smaller independents as well. Um, but yeah, um, and as a localization division, we have um, over 1,100 staff. Um, over 5,000 freelancers. Um, recently, we acquired um, a company called Sfera, so they've been integrated into the localization offering, which is the cloud-based software, yeah, which we'll be speaking later. Um, but yeah, that's deluxe quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sure. So we, uh, Zoo Digital, uh, create um, software uh, to service localization. So we've created a um, subtitling uh, software, foreign language dubbing software, localization software for artwork, uh, showcase screener software, and we also have a service, so we service as well as uh, create our own tools, so we service subtitling, we similarly do about 250,000 minutes a month of subtitling processing, uh, foreign language dubbing as well, we're doing about two or three hundred hours already a month of, uh, of servicing within our tool set. Uh, so we sort of build and then deploy and then sort of service through our own tool set. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I, want, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about how localization has, has changed in the, in the last year. Obviously with the content explosions and the, uh, the advent of companies like Netflix and Amazon that service different geographies. Uh, how do you think uh, localization uh, workflows has, have changed and uh, how do you manage to uh, uh, preserve quality with the increasing workload? I think. It's probably because of the increased workload, but the increased quality as yeah. well. Mm -hmm. I think previously, a lot of um, broadcasters, they just, it was a more of a, a side. They had to provide a lot of their subtitle files as opposed to they wanted to do it. Now, because of, um, content owners want to sell the content as best they can in, those, in different areas, that the quality is so high. Um, I suppose it's harder, probably takes a lot longer, but you have to find better translators, better QCers. Um, so that's probably a lot of the, like a bit difficult for us, I think. Yeah. Just keeping I think it's about volume. So at the end of the day, the SVOD sort of market explosion over the last few years has expanded the volume of, of business that you know vendors such as ourselves have to take on board. And there are only a certain amount of freelance translators, yeah. only a certain amount of freelance voice artists that we that, that exist within this you know the, the traditional sort of localization environment. So one of the challenges for us is to try and sort of expand that. Uh, freelance uh, base and train people to be able to be, you know, to, to be up to speed and up to scratch with the quality expectation. Yeah. Certainly for subtitling in every language set that yeah. is exploding. You know, I think the problem that we all have as well is we, obviously, we're all competitors and a lot of other localization companies worldwide, and we do share a lot of the same yeah. um, assets, a lot of the same translators. Yeah. Um, so it's trying to find get new talent, getting people trained, and having availability to be able to work when we need them to and, and the turnaround times and the, see that is another problem as well the turnaround times are getting shorter mm. and the quality still has to be kept at such a high level that proves it difficult and i think that's you, when you have multiple translators you can split a lot of the files do a lot of work separately do it in chunks mm. um, and but that doesn't help with the consistency of the cost uh, and, and another facet which is new really which the svod market has brought into play is it's not just english language content being translated into yeah. other languages but it's various language content being translated into other languages. So you have to have that sort of 
uh, um, a set of translators who have a multiple skill. Yeah. So, um, so that's a challenge in itself because the type of content as well as the volume expansion of content being processed is, is different as well. So you have to be very, uh, like your organizations have to be very flexible as yep. well. And how in the, from that perspective, how uh, has cloud technology played a mm. big role in uh, um, um, improving collaboration, of course, and mm -hmm. also time to market for, for, for translation? Yeah, because I think that's probably a lot of the problem, like um, traditionally it would all be a desktop localization software everyone would use. It was a lot slower, you'd be delivering files, you'd have to download files. Um, but it's not even just getting the translators to work on like, the cloud base as well, it's having like, clean interfaces that the account managers can use, get all the work done so the project management's less, and probably interface with all, a lot of the clients' APIs into yeah. all the clients' tools. And I think that's, it's not just the cloud based tools, it's everything around it. Yeah, it comes down to workflow management yeah. as well. So having transparency about where a project is, you know, in any time zone, if you're just logging into a system to sort of review uh, your status across multiple language orders. But also it's about um, having a cloud-based sort of uh, tool function is, is you can actually create training tools yeah. that onboard more translators, onboard more artists, essentially to sort of build up that that uh, uh, reservoir of, 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 um, of talent as well. So that gives us consistency if we have a cloud-based set of tools that gives us consistency around training uh, to, to bring them up to speed and you don't have to be in the same um, you know kind of uh, uh, area you don't have to be in the same sort of location you can very much deploy this from a you know worldwide perspective this sort of uh, yeah, but I think what we lacked a lot of time before is we were never able to pull like metrics for how well the translators were doing mm, like on yeah. a regular basis and so what you'd want to get to away and um, like you'd reward like the highest the best translators who are doing the best work on yeah. a consistent time, yeah. accepting all the work all the time, and like turning it around like fast. So you can never really drill down to that before before the cloud-based technology came into play. And but now you can run weekly, monthly reports on each individual translator, and like when they're failing, like you can see why. Then you can either remove them from your list or like speak to them, see, find out the reasons why, and try and help them. Yeah. So you've yeah. got also the intelligence and some sort of trackers to, yes. to, to yeah. track their work. Yeah. And that's about process improvement, yeah. you know, so translate a process improvement to encourage them to, you know, if there is any, any, anything you feel needs to be improved in their sort of workload to, to actually sort of retrain them and encourage that training with sort of, you know, training within the tool set that they can use to sort of um, refine their output. And what are, what are the other challenges uh, of uh, relying of, uh, on uh, outsource work on external translators? You mean using external translators? Yeah. It's uh, are there any other challenges? Well, it's f like finding the right, the amount of right translators, yeah. the availability, um, those are good enough. Um, the make sure they can deliver on time, because like if one translator falls sick, then it's because yeah. you're, you're heavily reliant on humans still. Yes, so if they right. fall sick, disappear, car crash, then can't get the work done. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, other than the car crash yeah. uh, analogy, yeah. uh, you, you, I think the the encouragement is that uh, we try to we're trying to sort of find new talent, but um, we don't want to sort of push away a translator from uh, from working with us if they. Um, our policy is ultimately the translators come on board with us, they use our tool set. So we're trying to discourage the third party usage of, of subtitling yeah. tools that are in the marketplace, some of which are freeware and some of which are you know traditional desktop tools that don't that they don't buy the upgrade features yeah. that essentially help them translate to you know really SVOD market sort of um, expectation and the higher quality expectation uh, around their sort of delivery so it's about consistency so using a cloud-based subtitling tool is updated once and it's updated globally in one in one instance yeah. and I think that's one of the sort of things that we're trying to help translators do and improve their performance in order to because we're, we're measured by our metrics mm -hmm. we're yeah. measured by our quality output which in, in turn is sort of you know produced by the translator themselves some of the um, other issues probably around security isn't it but now mm. before with the cloud base as well it's just a oh, it's always streaming before you'd always have to download the videos to start your work yeah. and because of piracy um, and because of like next day deliveries for a lot of the US broadcast stuff yeah. and theatrical titles you just have to um, make sure like everything's safe everything's recorded and you're always working off prelim files as well yeah. that um, all the files you're delivering to the translators are safe and there's always a big worry about leaking about blogging about mm. talking about any of the shows are working on, so that's that's a, that's a um, constant. And well, with all of our systems, content, yeah. watermarking those yeah. files yeah. once uh, with individual yeah. translator watermarks, you know, it is very very important. 
and that's what all about you know the cloud-based sort of system gives you much more sort of um, much more of an ability to do that. Thanks yeah. for that. Uh, we talked about uh, cloud technology. What about uh, technology that enable enable you to automate workflows, so mm -hmm. such as AI? Are they are are you increasingly using them? Uh, in the in your workflows, or are, are you still at a at an early stage? Mm, for us, we're still at a very we're using more memory tools. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um. So, like when the when the translator goes in to be, um, start the subtitle, it will come up with key names and phrases that they can use. So everything's sort of connected that way. And um, I think we're sort of quite a bit away off, aren't we, from like proper machine translation? Yeah, machine yeah. translation and AI really is is something that will learn, it will create as a learning process really yeah. on, on translation and what we're dealing with here is not sort of textual translation, we're not dealing with text, we're dealing with storytelling. Yeah. So to replace you know a storytelling mm -hmm. kind of um, a narrative with something that's much more kind of um, uh, uh, analysed or an analysis of a, of a translation, we're still not there yet. Mm -hmm. And we can build suggestion and suggestion yeah. terms that a translator can use or not use and that could be helpful you know, um, uh, in the near future, but I think we're still a few years off from yeah. true sort of uh, yeah. replacement process. It's like an analogy, isn't it, where they're saying like it's raining cats and dogs. Like mm. when you have to translate that into different languages, if you're just using text translation, it would just yeah. be verbatim. But that's yeah. not going to make sense in like Germany or Poland or elsewhere. Yeah. So that's that's where we're so far off in the AI just yet. So much translation at the moment is just uh, kind of support for human translators. Yeah. That, uh, yes, very much so, yeah. and we're still very much engaged with using but human we don't translators. Yeah. You know, but even with the AI, we don't think it will take away the need for human translators. They will, their roles will change and the jobs will change. They'll probably end up being more like post editors mm -hmm. or things like that, and that's opposed to just being translation. But there'll still be a need, and they're definitely for a very long time, probably in our lifetime, I think there'll always be a need. Thank you. Depends how long you live. Yeah. <laughs> Not long. After this weekend. <laughs> And of course, uh, we just heard about, for example, CBS uh, uh, announcing that uh, um, its uh, uh, direct-to-consumer of offering will be offered to uh, Canada as well. So more companies are going uh, are looking beyond their borders. Do you think that mm -hmm. uh, your work or workload your, is going to increase uh, in the next year? Yes, yeah. exponentially. It, it's, yeah. We were already seeing that expansion year yeah. on year for the last two or three years, and it's driven by the SVOD market and original programming being uh, created by not only the SVOD providers, but you know, uh, uh, bigger entities creating more quality content mm -hmm. to market. And not just quality content, there's a lot of non-scripted content yeah. being created and then distributed on platforms to fill in the gaps ultimately. And that all leads to localising. Yeah. But what you do find that with high volume of new work coming through, you'll find a high volume of new localization vendors coming through also. Yeah. So, so what might tend to happen, there'll be a lot of work, but then the market will be flooded with new offerings and new vendors, be able to do the work f as well. So sometimes that can take, that can diminish yeah. your volumes because of it. Yeah, yeah last, was, uh, last question I wanted to ask. What's the challenge of, uh, uh, obviously the, the workload is increasing, but what's the challenge of also reaching different devices with different formats? With uh, uh, obviously uh, uh, broadcasters delivering to mo uh, mobile devices as well as uh, on linear, uh, uh, are there any challenges from uh, from a localization perspective? Well, there's so many different file types, isn't there? there are, that's yeah, so there could be a consolidation of file types for sure. Yeah, you know, and that's a, a an industry-wide kind of uh, a problem, and also a regional. You know, kind of problem as well, yeah. but the way that you know our cloud tools sort of develop output, outputs are essentially you just set the outputs that you that you that you need from a certain translation, and it, it's it, it's not really a problem as such. It's yeah. just a you know you, you need to kind of ensure that your multiple outputs yeah. sort of set up. Because uh, you'd even find with one client who's like with one say one big studio, they might have seven or different tabs like within that division, like seven different types of file specs they'll want for subtitling. So mm. that's always trying to make sure you're delivering the right file as well to them. It means you can embed specifications in your yeah. output mode and they will be consistent throughout, you don't have to revisit them. So it's, uh, it's just a case of, of, of getting the spec right once and, and updating it when it needs updating on a global level. Yeah. Yeah. So I think what probably we'll get to is that like each client will probably create a, uh, like a mezzanine file so then yeah. they can just use that for all deliveries for all the formats, all like Netflix, Amazon, mm. Google afterwards but they'll just have the master file, like good quality well, suitable for all everything. That's the way it will probably go. Okay. Thank, thank you very much, thank Alan. You. Thank you You're very welcome. much, Matt. Thank you. Uh, you can find more about uh, business intelligence on the IBM website. Thanks. Mm -hmm.